I wanted to um, start by just paying a tribute to um, Dr. Richard Rockefeller. And he has been incredibly helpful um, in our work with the military, with trying to bring MDMA into the Department of Defense and the Veterans Administration. And, and Richard died um, not very long ago in a plane crash. And so just as I, that he was piloting in a, in a terrible storm. And so as I was sort of flying here, I was thinking about him. And, and Richard became um, a friend and an ally and had as much enthusiasm for uh, integrating psychedelics into the culture uh, as I did. And he had this um, way about him of trying to, um, what he talked about, his name, that he was born uh, with this name and it gave him a lot of opportunities and he tried to uh, sort of become comfortable with it and he became a doctor in order to have something that was his own, that wasn't something inherited. And from that, he started working at uh, Doctors Without Borders, eventually, and became sensitized to whole populations that are traumatized by war, by becoming refugees. And he started looking around for um, tools that would help whole populations overcome uh, what he saw would be multi-generational trauma, where it would go down uh, the generations. And he felt that drugs like MDMA were about the only things that we had for um, such large numbers of people that there aren't enough psychotherapists and of course MDMA works more effectively with psychotherapy but that there weren't enough psychotherapists and so he started really focusing in on trying to help with trying to um, open the door for uh, our culture to really integrate psychedelics and particularly when he approached me about um, four and a half years, about four years ago he said what is the biggest problem that you've got and it's that we had been trying to work in collaboration with the Department of Defense and with the Veterans Administration to deal with PTSD from you know, hundreds of thousands of veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan and also many left over with PTSD from Vietnam. And his um, cousin is Senator Jay Rockefeller who's on the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee. So the two of them started working with us to um, provide meetings, to provide political pressure, um, I can share this, that uh, Senator Rockefeller uh, met with uh, Robert McDonald, who's the new head of the VA, and he met with him the night before his confirmation hearing in the Senate. And one of the main purposes of that meeting was to tell the new head of the VA how important it was to continue to work with MDMA, that we had started in collaboration with the VA. And that's as a legacy for Richard. That's one of the things that, that he really accomplished. Um, I also wanted to, before I talk a little bit about what it means to make a drug into a medicine, psychedelics, through the FDA, and wh why that's important, um, I wanted to just share a tiny bit about the Zendo Project. And, um, those of you that are camping here, many of you may know that the rains destroyed the roof of it, but what the, what the Zendo Project is, is psychedelic harm reduction. And the reason that we're camping here, that there's the MAPS group is here, the Zendo Project has made an alliance with David Bronner and the Faux Mirage to offer this service to people at Burning Man who have difficult trips. And the reason that it's so crucially important is that we're trying to move to a post-prohibition world. And in a post-prohibition world, we're going to have lots of people that are using psychedelics for celebratory purposes, for recreational purposes, for um, all sorts of situations at festivals, and that not everybody is going to be able to fully integrate what happens to them. There'll be a lot of people that have challenging experiences. And so in a, in a way, what we're trying to do is have a self-regulatory community where we're able to gather together volunteers who are trained in psychedelic therapy, who are doctors, who are nurses, who are psychotherapists, others just trained from their own experience, who will offer compassionate care to others. And I think if we look at what's driving the drug war right now, it used to be this incredible zeal for prohibition, really ramped up by Nixon in the early 1970s and late 60s, was about cultural change. It was about the use of psychedelics 
a whole range of people who were challenging the status quo and then referred back to their psychedelic experience as having provided a certain kind of inspiration for the work that they were doing. And so it was mostly uh, political repression that criminalized all these drugs and stopped flourishing psychedelic research all over the world. And that has faded over the last 40 years. And now, what, what the last bastion that's driving the drug war is parents worried about their kids. And when they think about their kids, they think about going to electronic dance music festivals and, and using marijuana and using MDMA and Molly and ecstasy, using um, LSD and somehow or other having bad outcomes. So I think if we can provide examples of communities that support each other, support those that run into trouble with their use of psychedelics, that we will demonstrate that in a way um, this community can be trusted to be a self-regulatory community in a post-prohibition world. So even though our main work is trying to make psychedelics into prescription medicines, the harm reduction work that we do is an essential part of that. And what I've found is that it's not actually made it more difficult for us to get permission from the FDA or the DEA um, or institutional review boards to do the research. That even though it's clearly about non-medical use, that by just talking about how we're involved with this community and providing these services, um, it sort of helps people in these regulatory agencies feel more comfortable because they know that um, if these drugs are made into medicines, and then people's perceptions of these drugs are changed because of that, that eventually that will help towards moving towards the most prohibition world. And of course that will first happen with marijuana, and we see it's happening you know, in front of our eyes. Um, and psychedelics will be a lot um, slower than that because they're more powerful. They're, um, they require more care and more preparation. But, but the harm reduction work that we do here is the reason that um, that I come, and the reason that we're um, aligned with David Bronner and, and the work that we're doing here at, at Faux Mirage with the Zendo Project. So it's really a crucial part of what we did. Now, the DEA has tried to criminalize psychedelic harm reduction, and I don't know if um, any of you have heard about uh, Boom Festival, which was, um, Boom Festival is in Portugal, and it's on the full moon in August every two years. It's 40,000 people this year, and it's the openly psychedelic celebratory festival. And because drugs are decriminalized in Portugal, they're able to have the world's example of psychedelic harm reduction. So they actually have um, thin layer chromatography, drug testing on site, where drugs can be tested and people know what they're taking. And then the festival organizers pay for a whole team of around 40 people to provide care. And instead of being hidden away, the way our Zendo project is, it's right out in front in the main thoroughfare so everybody knows that it's there and that's one of the things that the festival organizers say that they're most proud of for instituting the psychedelic harm reduction. But in the U.S., because of the laws, the DEA has tried to criminalize harm reduction so we end up having a harm maximization policy. And so that, that's uh, to scare people and it doesn't really work and that's, that's what we're trying to be as an antidote for. And so our main work and what I, my talk was, uh, um, is about is what it means to uh, medicalize psychedelics. And so I'd like to start, though, by just saying why that's important. And I don't think that medicalizing psychedelics is the be-all and the end-all. And in fact, it's only a small, marginal part of what we do. I mean, it's very important to help people with post-traumatic stress disorder or help people who are anxious about dying or help people who have... Um, social anxiety because of autism. And there, there's a whole number of different things that we're doing in terms of medicalizing psychedelics. But really, I think the most important use of psychedelics is for personal growth, for spiritual connections, and not necessarily part of... <laughs> and not necessarily part of traditional religions either. I mean, one of the problems of religious freedom is you have to have a religion. <laughs> So, um, so it, it's more like 
um, spiritual freedom. And it'll take a long time for us to get that through the legal system because if each one of us, in a way, is our own spiritual guide, then it's part of an individual choice and that's more like drug legalization than it is like religious freedom. So that's where there is the Native American church, there's half a million people in the Native American church who can legally use peyote. According to the federal government, it's the only religion that has a racial requirement meaning that you have to have 25% Indian blood, according to the federal government, to be part of uh, the Native American church. States don't care about that so much, but, uh, and then there's the Unyao de Vegetal and the Santo Daime, which are churches that use ayahuasca. But again, these are churches from Brazil and Peru in that area. They have sort of syncretic churches, mostly with Roman Catholic. They have very hierarchical structure. They have a male-dominated uh, priesthood. Um, you know, they're, they're not the kind of things that we would normally see would be part of progressive America. And yet, in order to make these religious freedom claims, we've had to, um, or these groups that have to sort of stick with the way the religions are practiced. So, for me, I think I was very influenced early on uh, you know, by the Holocaust, by World War II, by growing up in a country that was in the Cold War with Russia, with the whole nuclear annihilation, and then the whole Vietnam War. And that was the last year of the lottery. So all of these kind of um, murderous threats, um, I felt were traced back to this distinction that people make between us and them. That somehow or other we're different than these other people, and we can dehumanize and kill these other people, because they're not really equal to us. And that at the same time, we can do that to the environment. We can trash the environment because that's not part of us, that's out there. And the antidote to that, and this is kind of like the, the hippie idealism of the 60s, which I, I think actually has a lot of substance and a lot of validity, is that if you can have a profound sense of your connection with the universe, with all of life, that and you're part of nature, that we're part of everything, we're part of each other, and that fundamentally we're not different from each other. If you think that, it's one thing. If you feel it, like Rita Marley had one of her great albums, it was called Who Feels It, Knows It. And so I think there's a difference between experiential knowledge and intellectual knowledge. And so once you really take it into your heart and you feel this interconnections, then I think there's a large set of political implications from that identification. Um, the UNESCO Charter, the preamble to the UNESCO Charter, Charter, says, since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. And Albert Einstein said that the splitting of the atom has changed everything accept our mode of thinking, and hence we drift towards unparalleled catastrophe. What shall be required if mankind is to survive is a whole new mode of thinking. So what is that mode of thinking? It's this mystical sense of how we're all connected. That, that's what I think it is. And so it's how do we make that something that um, we personally experience more than just think it? And how do we help millions of people and billions of people have that same sense? And for me, it didn't come from my traditional, uh, my bar mitzvah. <laughs> you know, it didn't come from the religious traditions that I was uh, brought up in. And it didn't really come from school. And it, it, it came from reading and thinking, but it more for me also came from my psychedelic experiences. The most mystical experience of my life was under the influence of MDMA, camping out on the beach on Big Sur um, by myself one time. So I think that the struggle that our culture has um, used to repress psychedelics, it's because of the fear of the unconscious, the fear of our shadows, the fear of what we project out into the others. And that's a lot of hard work to integrate all of that. So for me, the work of trying to integrate psychedelics into our culture is trying to make a more mystical, spiritual-based world. And I had this confirmed for me from a pretty unlikely spot. In 1983, I read a book by Robert Mueller, who was the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. 
and he was like the mystic of the UN. And the book was New Genesis, Shaping a Global Spirituality. And it had the picture of the Earth on the cover from space. So I think we are existing at a time of history where the interconnectedness is more apparent than ever before. And at the same time, cultures that were separated are now bumping against each other more so than ever before. And so it's harder for any culture to say, we've got the truth, we've got the only truth, we're the one way. So I wrote this letter to Robert Mueller and I said, I, I believe what you said. You said that the countries of the world have the UN to mediate disputes. Most of those disputes have religious basis. And so we need this sort of global spirituality. I said, you didn't say anything about psychedelics in your book. And I said, here's the research, the Good Friday experiment that talks about psilocybin being helpful to produce mystical experiences. And would you help um, support the renewal of psychedelic research? And to my utter surprise, I was just a college undergraduate. He wrote me back from the UN, a handwritten note, and said, yes, I, you read my book correctly. And I will introduce you to a bunch of mystics. And um, I read between the lines. and, and he said, send him MDMA. <laughs> so I sent them MDMA, and they used Brother David Steindl-Ross, the Rabbi Zalman Schachter, uh, Vanya Palmer's people that were from the Jewish tradition, the Zen tradition, the Catholic tradition, and then they used MDMA and reported back to him. Now this was when MDMA was still legal. So, um, so that's where I'm coming from. That's where I think this mission to try to integrate psychedelics in our culture is so essential. And I also think that the situation with global warming, with the wars that we see now, is so severe and important that there's a, a sense of change. I mean, we see it all around us with the eroding support for prohibition and the, the movements of many states for medical marijuana and marijuana legalization. So I think we have this incredible opportunity and strategically trying to figure out how to work through the resistance of the culture and the vested interests, I think religious freedom is one way to work on it. And I think it's very important, um, the work that Jonathan here is doing with the Ethnobotanical Stewardship Council to try to create standards for the use of ayahuasca and other substances um, in Brazil and, and Peru and sustainable and ethical. And, and yet I do think, as I said before, that religious freedom, it's really going to be um, too hard to do that. that that's going to follow, I think, medicalization. And if we look at the FDA and we look at what's happened with marijuana, it's happened not at the FDA level, at the state level, but medical marijuana has created support for marijuana legalization. And we're getting pretty sophisticated about how the political work is done. And so some of the exit polling from some of the um, initiatives have shown that the single most important factor of whether somebody is in favor of legalizing marijuana is not whether they've used marijuana themselves or whether they're continuing to use it. That's what you would think. If a user doesn't want to be a criminal, they would be in favor of legalization. And mostly they do. But the single most important predictive factor is does somebody know a medical marijuana patient? And if they know a medical marijuana patient, they're in favor of marijuana legalization because there's so much propaganda, so much misinformation, that if you can have a direct personal contact with someone that it works for, then you start questioning in your mind all the things you've been told about how, you know, puff of marijuana and, and then you're a heroin addict. <laughs> you know, or, or you've lost, you know, 20 points from your IQ and now, now you're a couch potato that can't do anything. So I think the idea of trying to take psychedelics through the FDA is a way of trying to change people's attitudes about the broader question of how does our society handle psychedelics and at the same time it responds to some of the best uses of psychedelics which are as adjuncts to psychotherapy and freud talked about dreams as the royal road to the unconscious and i think psychedelics play a very similar role that in, and in some ways they're um, more powerful because they, um, often the um, emotions of dreams are, are, can be as intense as psychedelics. And the sort of emotional logic of dreams are, are very much like psychedelics. But there's something about the duration of time in an experience that helps you struggle with it, that helps you to be stuck for a long time, and then you can make the next moves to uh, integrate and grow. So there's something about the length of the psychedelic experience which is very valuable. So, 
what we're trying to do with medicalization is to look at, of all the psychedelics that are out there, which one is, because um, again, we need to, to narrow down from this broad vision to the uh, particular strategy. So MDMA is not like a classic psychedelic. It's not like LSD or psilocybin or mescaline or uh, ayahuasca even. It's very subtle. It's open-hearted. It's more easy to integrate because the state is not so different from your normal state. Um, and many psychiatrists and psychotherapists would be comfortable trying MDMA themselves. I mean, right now, in our work with the Veterans Administration, we have been able to get permission from the FDA to give MDMA to therapists as part of their training in a legal context. It was, it, was, um, it was astonishing because basically we said to the FDA, as we imagine uh, having 20 and 30 sites of psychotherapy, we're going to need to train a lot more therapists. And there are a limited number of people that have the underground skills and the above ground credentials. So we're going to need, need to train people who have the above ground credentials but don't have the underground experience and don't want to be criminals. So we've been able to um, work with the FDA and they told us how to design this protocol that is a looks like scientific research. It actually is scientific research, but it's uh, the looking at the psychological effects of MDMA taken in a therapeutic setting by healthy volunteers. And we can limit who is in that study to, to therapists in our training program. And so we've been able to offer that to therapists from all over the world, and including some VA therapists. So we're, we're, uh, I, I keep thinking about how during the 60s, Abby Hoffman and the Yippies, the big demonstration where they tried to levitate the Pentagon, which did not levitate. But, but now we're going inside the Pentagon to try to turn them on the psychedelics. And it's working. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, and I think it, it, it's, it raises a really important issue that I, I, I'd like to briefly discuss here, which is that um, some people have raised the concern that by working with the military and by working with people who are traumatized from their experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan, that somehow or other we're um, greasing the wheels of the military machine and that it's unethical what we're doing. And I think that's um, not true, but I think it's an important thing to discuss very briefly because I think, of course, the same thing could be said about any medical advance. Right now, people are blown to smithereens and they survive more than they ever did. So we're having more and more soldiers who are surviving in more and more disabled states with more and more trauma. And so you could say, that uh, the cost of war is going down in a sense because more people are surviving. And so any medical technology, you could say, that's used by military doctors is making it easier to uh, wage war. So again, I think there's a humanitarian aspect to it, but I think with psychedelics, what we're doing is we're bringing the technology of peace into the heart of the war-making machine. And I'm, I'm not trying to say that I'm against war because I feel that there is times when you need to defend yourselves. And it's a dangerous world. So I'm not a pacifist. I don't think that it's okay to just um, not have a national defense. So I think at some point in time, you you know, we just look around the world. There, there's a lot of people that are not thinking rational, that are not that compassionate, um, that would kill us if they could. So I think we do need a military. It's very important, but we need it really to be um, humane and a last resort. And so by Working with people with MDMA, we're helping people work through difficult emotions, understand themselves, accept themselves and others. So I, I think that the criticism that by working with the military that we're really doing something negative and harmful, um, I, I don't feel as accurate. And so I, I've thought about it a lot, I feel it's comfortable. And at the same time, I feel that in the wider culture, if you look around, you'll see that um, veterans have a great amount of respect and appreciation by the mainstream. And so what we're trying to show is that psychedelics are helpful not just for people who go to Burning Man or people who are hippies, you know, but it's for um, those people who have never done psychedelics before but who are suffering in, in, in any number of different ways. So I think our choice of working with the military is strategic and I think it's also ethical.
Now, the first drug that was ever made into a uh, medicine through a nonprofit context, and that's what we're doing because the pharmaceutical industry is not interested in psychedelics because they can't, they're off path. The major foundations that support medical research are not interested yet because of the controversy, and so far the federal government, which supports a lot of medical research, has not been willing to invest money either. So it's really a non-profit drug development process. And the first drug that was ever made into a medicine in a non-profit context was the abortion pill, RU46, in 1999. And that drug was um, made into a medicine by the Population Council. Um, Warren Buffett was one of the major funders of that effort, and also the Rockefellers and the Pritzkers were part of this group. And it was because any company that would have made the abortion pill into a medicine, all their other products would have been boycotted. So the idea of nonprofit drug development is becoming more and more popular. And in fact, the Gates Foundation is supporting a lot of drugs to be made into medicines for Africa, drugs that the pharmaceutical companies wouldn't make enough money on. So what we've decided to do is focus on MDMA more so than LSD or psilocybin or other drugs, which are more of a psychological challenge, more about dissolving the ego. Um, I think that those drugs can also be and will also be made into medicines, and maybe even faster than MDMA, we don't know. But for us, I think the gentleness of MDMA, and then we looked around, and what are the various things that MDMA is great for? And one of them is couples therapy, or just relationships. But from the FDA point of view, um, having a, a challenging relationship is not a disease. You can't, you know, so we need to find diseases that we're trying to cure or treat, or treat their symptoms. And so again, we want to pick medicines that are treating people that are appreciated by the mainstream. So treating psychedelics are terrific in certain supported ways for treating drug addiction. And yet drug addicts are the other, usually in our culture. Um, but it's important, we have some research with Ibogaine and, and Ayahuasca in the treatment of addiction because what we're trying to show is that it's not the drug itself, it's how it's used that determines the value of it or the risk of it. But again, the addicts are the other. I think the other one is the people who are dying, and that's all of us. And so if you can help people who are anxious about dying, then you're going to be speaking to everybody, speaking to the mainstream. And that's very important. But again, some of the spiritual changes that take place as you prepare to die as you reduce your anxiety are not always adequately measured by the measures of anxiety and depression that the FDA has used in the past to make drugs into a medicine. So I think it's very important that, um, that we do the research for end of life as well, uh, you know, death anxiety. And that's going, that's, so the Hefter Research Institute is doing terrific work with psilocybin for end of life. They're doing good work with addiction. And for us, strategically, we picked MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder. We do have two studies um, with different indications. One of them is for autistic adults with social anxiety. It's just starting at uh, UCLA. And it's not that um, we sort of thought of this independently. It's that large numbers of people who've gone to Burning Man or gone to various raves and festivals who are young people on the autistic spectrum taken molly ecstasy mdma and reported that it helped them understand their emotions and helped them relate to others better and posted stories on the internet so it's crowdsourced drug development <laughs> where people are reporting what these drugs do used by tens of millions of people and so alicia danforth a woman, his, her, her phd was trying to um, contact all these people and speaking to them about what it is that um, they did and talking to their families and, and on the basis of that we've started that study. And then in the, the Bay Area we're starting a new study with MDMA for people who are anxious about dying. But our main work is PTSD and we've completed two studies and in Switzerland and the United States. The first study in the US was incredible. It was 20 people who had PTSD an average of over 19 years and they had failed on pharmacotherapy, failed on psychotherapy, and over 80% of them no longer had PTSD at the end of our treatment. And, and we 
track them down um, an average of three and a half years later, a long-term follow-up, and showed that the benefits were sustained over time. So something fundamental has changed in the brain. We're finishing a new study right now. Uh, we're we're going to finish. We've got studies underway in veterans, police officers, and firefighters. So again, you can see that we're speaking to um, the mainstream, and we actually have had firefighters, and we've got our first police officer with PTSD from work um, being treated in the study, um, and that's in Charleston, South Carolina. We have another study in Boulder, which is uh, 23 people PTSD from any cause. And we have studies in Israel and also starting soon in Vancouver, in Canada. So once we finish these studies next summer, we'll have about 90 people that we'll have treated. Um, it will have cost us, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of four, four and a half million dollars to do all of these studies. Um, and we're going to go to the FDA and say, here's our data. Now we want to design phase three studies. And those are the large-scale multi-site studies that are the ones required to prove safety and efficacy. And we figure that those are going to cost probably in the neighborhood of um, 17, 18 million dollars. Uh, we already have about six million dollars of that left to us in bequests from people who um, put maps in their will. And we believe that we can raise the rest of it. And that in 2021, we anticipate going to the FDA to present the data, and we hope at that point that MDMA would be made into a medicine. Now, we have an a Indiegogo campaign. So I'm talking all these big numbers, but um, you know, we have an Indiegogo campaign right now to raise $50,000 to finish the veteran study. We've got over um, 640 donors, and we've raised uh, $39,000 as of this morning people that are giving $50 or, or, or anything. So everybody can help. Um, but one of the things that I didn't know until a few years ago, um, which is sort of an exercise in humility, I, I you know did my PhD at Harvard on how to regulate uh, psychedelic medicines. I studied the FDA. I had the FDA lawyer, uh, chief, the chief counsel for the FDA on my dissertation committee. But I missed a very important piece of information that, I didn't know for over 20 years, and only found out a couple of years ago. Um, and it was kind of funny, because I, I went to this uh, gathering with my wife, and uh, I smoked a bunch of pot, and I was like, all right, I'm just going to have nothing to do with work. This is just going to be a total, you know, playtime. <laughs> and I happened to uh, run into a patent lawyer who told me something that was so crucial about my work that it just left me speechless um, at the fact that how good it was and also um, how I'd missed it. And so what it means is there's this obscure policy that was passed actually by Congress in 1984, so I should have known about it. Um, and what it's called is that for drugs that are off patent, and for drugs for which the uses are in the public domain. So about 20 years ago, MAPS, we hired a patent attorney to develop an anti-patent strategy. Because we're a nonprofit, we're doing it all for the public good. So I didn't want us to do all this research with MDMA or other psychedelics and then have somebody patent it and then, you know, charge enormous prices. And so what I found is that the way in which you defeat the patents is that people can only get a patent if they've invented something. So if, it's, if there's information in the public domain about stuff, then somebody else didn't invent it. So every new use of MDMA or LSD, or anything that's unusual for the weirdest kind of conditions. Um, if somebody reports it, we post their story on our website, and then nobody can patent it. So we have this very successful anti-patent strategy. Um, but the FDA has developed, and Congress created this policy so that for drugs that are off patent, for which there's no use patents, if you make these drugs into medicines, the, the FDA will give what's called data exclusivity, which means that you're the only group that can use that data for, to make the drug into a medicine. For five years, nobody can use your data to make it a generic medicine. And then it takes somebody um, who wants to make it a ger generic medicine a, a year to work with the FDA to prove that their drug is a generic, is successful. So there's basically six years of protection that you get. Now, somebody else could do their own research, but as I've indicated, it's going to take more than five years to do it anyway. So now it turns out that MAPS may have the opportunity, and Hefter as well for psilocybin, 
if we're the ones that make these things into medicines, we will have this six year period where we're the only ones that can market the drug. Now, what we could do is just say, we're gonna give it up to everybody. You know, and so it'll be a generic right away. But the other thing is that it takes an enormous amount of time and effort um, and struggle to raise the, all the money that we need to do this research. So if we could have the six year period and make money from selling this drug, and again, we don't have to be like the pharmaceutical industry where we charge you know, 100 times more than it costs us to make the drug or more. Sometimes it's way more than that even for um, orphan drugs. You know, and the other part of what, what we're doing is to recognize that we're talking about drug-assisted psychotherapy. So for our project right now with MDMA, it's about um, 80 hours of psychotherapy that's provided. It's 40 hours with a male-female co-therapist team. So that's our model. There's two therapists, around 40 hours of therapy, 80 hours of therapy. So if you say even $100 an hour, something like that for the therapist time, $8,000, if the drug costs $500 or $1,000, it's really not that much compared to the therapy. So it looks like the drug will end up costing $40, $50 to make MDMA in a pure medical grade way. So if we charge 150 bucks, there's enough um, profit in there, depending on how many therapists we train, how many sessions, that we can fund further research from the sales of the first drug that makes it into a medicine. So then, now we have this chance to become a sustainable nonprofit from the sales of successful medicines. And what we've also learned is that if we were to do that, that from the IRS point of view, inside the nonprofit, that doing all the research to make it a medicine, that's, that's perfectly appropriate as a nonprofit context. But once you have a business and you're making a bunch of money from it, then you could lose your nonprofit status. So what we've, we're starting to do is to explore with lawyers and accountants the idea of creating what's called a benefit corporation. And I don't know if David Bronner's mentioned it, but you know, Bronner's is talking about a benefit corporation. So these are corporations whose goal is not to maximize money, that they have social benefit as well. And you can articulate that. So that we look at one of the, what are the main criticisms of the legalization of marijuana right now is that it's gonna be like big tobacco and big alcohol and there's gonna be these companies that are just selling marijuana to, to kids and to make the most money. So what we're gonna to try to do is both make MDMA into medicine in a nonprofit context and then try to market it with a benefit corporation rather than for profit maximizing. And I think that that's a potential model for how other drugs could be marketed in our culture. So that's the big vision. And if there's any time for questions, um, I'd like to um, entertain them. Yes. Thank you. Um, could you come up here just so we can... Uh, or you can repeat the question. Okay. <laughs> Have you ever tried to find the individuals in the DEA or the FDA that are the decision-making authority and just have a discussion like this and just say, hey, you know, two out of five people or whatever that take this, say it's one of the most significant effects in their life. Like, there's something here. Let's explore this as opposed to put people in cages. What you're doing with the medicine is a good strategy, but what are those conversations like? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, mostly we've sued the DEA. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and in fact, that's how David Rodder and I first bonded, because he was suing the DEA about trying to grow hemp, and we were suing the DEA about trying to grow marijuana for medicine. So the, 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 the most important thing here is that the FDA, those kind of conversations that we've had with the FDA, have been completely and utterly successful. So that in 1992, there was a meeting at the FDA where they called an advisory committee, and it was to decide whether psychedelic research should resume again after decades of suppression, where there was none all over the world. And Sasha Shilgan and um, a group of other people were there. Um, and, and the FDA uh, decided that they would open the door to psychedelic and marijuana research. So the FDA is our main ally, and I would say not because they're pro-psychedelic or pro-medical marijuana, but they're pro-science, and they're pro-letting um, 
And at the same time, the FDA knows that a lot of the drugs that they have made into medicines have an abuse potential. The opiates, you know, methamphetamine is medicine, you know, so that they're not scared by the risks of psychedelics. Right. So the conversations that we've had with the FDA have been terrific, and um, the conversations with the DEA have been less so. So it's, it's like a, a mirror opposite, where the DEA is very entrenched in their um, resistance to medical use. And if you look at the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and they, they've done surveys of drug use over the last 40 years, and the one finding, the fundamental finding that they have come up with is that drug use goes up when perceived risk goes down. All right, so what's important about that, first off, is drug use, in their view, is abuse. They don't make any distinction between use and abuse. And at the same time, perceived risk is not actual risk. It's just what people believe and how you can scare people. So the concern that they have is that when you medicalize a drug, that people have been told is terribly dangerous, that you are uh, reducing the perception of risk and you're gonna increase the use and that's gonna be a big problem. So I, I, I have had some tremendous situation happen um, about four months ago uh, because we're trying to do medical marijuana research and we really haven't talked much about that but I'll just say that the um, we have our own independent sources of supply of MDMA, LSD, um, so psilocybin, all these drugs are produced by multiple for-profit producers licensed by the DEA. However, marijuana is monopolized by the government, so there's only one source. And so we've been trying to do a study with marijuana for post-traumatic stress disorder in veterans in Arizona with Sue Sisley as the principal investigator. We have the FDA approval because, again, they're sympathetic, and it's been... Um, blocked by for about three years by the Public Health Service, National on Drug Abuse, in March we finally got approval from there. And so we're moving forward with this study, and then the University of Arizona fired Sue for political reasons. But what happened was we were contacted by a senior retired DEA agent who wanted to volunteer to help us get this study moving forward. And it turns out that he says that he had a son who was a veteran, who is 50% disabled by PTSD. So it's again what I said before about if you know medical marijuana patient, people's attitudes change. Now he's not in favor of uh, marijuana legalization. So we now have a, a former DEA working as a consultant to us to try to help us do the research on the medical use of marijuana. But really it's more about um, at least still, it's very confrontational with the DEA. And so we've had to work politically. We, we've just had 30 uh, members of Congress send a letter to the Secretary of Health and Human Services saying, end this public health service review. And the Obama administration, um, sadly enough, I would say, is, is fairly cowardly when it comes to drug policy reform, although they've done some very good things in that they have not cracked down on Washington and Colorado in their marijuana legalization. So I, I think your question for me is the heart of things because it's really about talking to the people that disagree with us yeah. and trying to change their minds. And these are very reasonable things that it does. It's all benefits. Yeah. I, I think that, that from our perspective, it's benefits. From their perspective, uh, it erodes the drug war, which still is really good. And, and a lot of times they believe things about these drugs that we know are not true, but they've been educated. Like my kids um, in school, or, you know, the D.A.R.E. program, many of you have heard, but the D.A.R.E. program still teaches people that marijuana causes lung cancer, which the science is clear that marijuana does not cause lung cancer. So I think a lot of these people are motivated, and, and I think they're looking for a way out. And I think that we have so much violent crime in America, so much you know, love of guns in America, that, that we're not trying to say the D.E.A. should be, uh, you know, all those people should be fired. It's just that they should be focused on violent crime, more things that we really care about. So, um, and, and I felt that I, I've had a fair opportunity to be able to talk um, with DEA people about my own experiences with psychedelics. Because again, you can tell stories about what you've done, but if there's no evidence, you can't be thrown in jail for it. So I do try that, and I think what you're saying is the, the whole thing about talking to the those people that disagree, that's, in a way, the strategy of the military. You know, one of the people that uh, you talk about cultural ambassadors, um, Larry Hagman, for example, was Dallas, you know, was JR in Dallas. 
Well, it turns out that he did LSD therapy during the 60s, and he wrote about that in his book. So I contacted him, and it took me a couple of years, I finally reached him, and then he became a supporter of MAPS. And he had a lot of credibility in circles that we didn't have. So I, I think the thing is for all of us to think about, um, particularly with your families, that if psychedelics have been important to you, just like we've seen with the gay rights movement, where people are coming out, and, and you know, people have said that um, you know everybody knows somebody that's gay. They don't just they just don't know that they know people are gay. But now people are speaking out, and then you see, wow, you can have a, a, a more or less you know a normal happy life if you're gay. So I think that the idea of people who have had um, beneficial experiences that the drugs have been good in their lives have a special responsibility to speak out. And I think the thing about Timothy Leary was that he did an awful lot of good, but he also had this idea that um, he was part of the counterculture, and also to an intern on dropout. Well, I did take LSD. I dropped out of college for 10 years, but I always felt that I was going to come back. And later he said that he was really talking about tune in, turn in, drop out, and then come back, you know, <laughs> smarter <laughs> and, and more whole. So I, I think that that is part of the... Um, responsibility and opportunity of people that have benefited from psychedelics to speak out first to your families, to your parents, you know, to your relatives, and then in some larger ways. And I think one of the big factors right now that we have going for us is the aging baby boomers. So first off, there's loads of people that used psychedelics when they were young in the 60s and 70s. They gave it up because of their families, because of their jobs, because drug, drug testing at work, and they've made a success of their lives. And now that there are 60s, 70s, and 80s, they're thinking more about death, thinking more about spirituality. There's this massive return for um, of baby boomers back to drugs, <laughs> back to psychedelics. And so, you know, my wife and I talked about our, looking forward to our psychedelic retirement. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think that there's people that have all of this credibility that they've earned, but people don't know that they were influenced by psychedelics. So we, we also know about Steve Jobs, and just as one example, we talked about it as being one of the most important experiences of his life, who's started the wealthiest company in the world. So there's something about Silicon Valley. Also, you know, um, Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, none of those companies do drug testing of their employees. And they, they're, they're smart not to do that. So I, I do think that this coming out is where we all need to, to um, where we can all play a role in ending prohibition by the coming out.